This week on the Ritual Misery Podcast, we take a break from our usual miserable attempt at making you laugh and concentrate on what we've been told time and time again is our strength. Being highly vocal about being average dudes, sharing our average lives, and sharing our average experiences. With the events of the, of the past few weeks, there have been many podcasts focusing on issues of privilege and race. Some have tried to explain the plight of people of color, some have shared the experiences of the oppressed, and many have shared opinions on the worldwide responses of protests, riots, and calls to political action. And yet, so many more have just ignored it and tried to press on without so much as a mention in order to protect themselves from backlash. Avoiding topics is not the ritual misery way, and we are not experts on... Well, anything really. But we are white guys with very different backgrounds, different political beliefs, and different family structures. And we both feel very strongly that racism sucks. This week, we want to share our experiences as ignorant white boys growing up to intentionally less ignorant white men. While no Ritual Misery episode is intended for kids, this episode may include topics in language that may offend some people and challenge some deeply held beliefs. That's kind of the point. Hello and welcome to the Richard Misery Podcast, episode 249 for Thursday. Um, don't have my show notes up. The 11th of June? Shit, is that what it is? Okay, yeah. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm, give, I'm being given the thumbs up over here in the corner. Uh, this is a show where two lifelong friends and their guests celebrate all things geek. I'm Amos. That's Kent over there on the far side. Hey, Kent, say something. Hi, something. Uh, you, you can't even get that right, dude. Like, <laughs> what is, there's there's an everlasting oh, problem man. on this show of just you, just you. I'm just gonna say, I uh, just me saying <laughs> things in the microphone. It's a problem. <laughs> uh, we are joined this week by a longtime friend of mine and my wife's, Royce Kaufman. AKA, Hello. if you look on my phone, he's known as Black Man Down. Uh, that just tells you the kind of relationship we've had and the inside jokes we've we've carried on for years. Um, Royce, uh, say hi to the people. Hello, people. See, Kent, why? Like you fucking do this every <laughs> couple weeks, man. You can't do this shit. Like, oh man, what is wrong with uh, you? I'm I'm so complacent and just out of practice. <laughs> uh, you need to be on the show more often, Amos. Uh, uh, also, w welcome, Royce. I'm glad to have you on the show. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Speaking <laughs> of me being on the show more often, we also have the misses here tonight. Uh, Rick, say hi to all the people that can only ever hear you on one other podcast. Hi to all the people that can only ever hear me on one other podcast. Kent. Dude. <laughs> yes. Like... Don't that just hurt. means that black people can't conform. That's all that means. Oh. <laughs> we do what the man tells us, right, Royce? That's all. Wow. That's really, that's really it. Wow. As you can see, all the red lights behind Amos there, that's that's what all that means. So. Yeah, apparently. That's, that's the, the voice of the man coming down on, on whatever. We're just trying to get past this episode. That's all we're trying to do. <laughs> That's all, right. all we're trying to do. So uh, Kent, Kent and I were talking about doing this episode, and we were like, well, should we talk about the BLM thing or not? Should we, like, what, what, and uh, we were going to kind of, like, just breeze by it because it's not, it's not necessarily our place to talk. And then I got to thinking about it, and that's exactly what the man wants us to do is not talk about it and not bring it up and not, you know, and just – blow it by as quickly as possible. So I reached out uh, reached out to Royce because, well, as he put it, I'm the, he's the only black friend I have, which is not true. But uh, he's, he's one, of the, one of the few very close black friends I have that uh, I'm open to talking to things like this about or uh, with. And um, he's the one that hasn't been on the show. So the others would be uh, Owen J.J. Stone, who's in the chat room right now. And Curtis LaRock, who's actually, has he been on the podcast? I think we've scheduled him. I don't know if we've ever actually had him on the He's show. He's been in post-show. Yeah. He's, um, um, I, I think he was a guest once. I think he was a yeah. guest once. A long I, I, time ago. Like, like a couple years ago, yeah. Uh, so we have Royce on. And uh, Royce, how would you ex explain to people how we know each other? Well, we were in the military together, and you were my uh, inadequate supervisor. Uh, Damn. So that says a lot. 
No, but we were stationed together in Hawaii and uh, was my supervisor. And uh, ever since then, we've been really good friends. If uh, if longtime listeners of the show have ever heard me talk about the time that I played Pimp the Dork, uh, where I said, hey, dude, uh, I need a new outfit and I have no sense of style. Can you come help me out? Royce was, was my, uh, my my pimp on that one. <laughs> so, I got him dressed to go to his human. family reunion. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I still have those clothes, and uh, they mostly still fit. No, they don't. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't believe that. For a no. Like, I, I'm they, they, those clothes fit me about as well as those jeans you've had since high school still fit you. Like, you can put them on. Are, what the jeans I had in high school? Are you talking about me? Yeah. Shit, I can't fit those motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Not in public, anyway. <laughs> wow. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that, that pretty much sums it up. Uh, I, w- while I was going through my divorce um, from my first wife, uh, Royce was one of the people that I leaned on a lot for emotional support, and basically, he didn't give me any emotional support. He just made me laugh at stupid shit a lot, which was kind of what I needed at the time. And then. Then he started going through a divorce or breakup, and uh, he leaned on me for for emotional support, and I didn't provide any. I just made him laugh a lot about stupid shit. So that's kind of where our, our, our relationship was. I was only a supervisor for, what, about six months or something like that? Like, you got there, and you, you, you came to mock, and I was like, hey, hey, and then I kind of, like, left. <laughs> well, it was pretty much they understood that you couldn't supervise me. So our supervisor decided, well, I'll take him because Amos can't do it. Uh, so... That's pretty much. That's not. She took over. That's not untrue. She took over. That's yeah. not untrue. Like, so, if 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 Sergeant Bullock knew anything about me, is the fact that I could work my ass off, but I didn't have time or the cognitive patience. aptitude to supervise other people. <laughs> you could barely supervise yourself. Yeah, I was. I'm. I'm. I'm exceptionally good, and people that work with me now can. And my wife could tell you this. I am really good at setting shit up. I'm not so good at keeping it going. So. <laughs> That says a lot. That says a lot. Dude. <laughs> that's, that's oh, wow. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Um, anyway, so as I was telling Rick yep. the other night, uh, Kent, you and I, you, we grew up in Indiana. Well, the time that we grew up together, we were in Indiana. I grew up in, in Southern California. I was, I like to say the token white kid from, from the area because, well, I was one of very few white kids in my my block. Um, and I went through a lot of, shall we say less than beneficial behavior and attitude from other people. Like I got picked on a lot and everything else could be partly because of of the dorky white kid that played Dungeons and Dragons, but, um, partly just because I was, I was the white kid that didn't have a lot of friends. And then I moved to Indiana and I became the Hispanic kid because of my last name, which by the way, not Hispanic, as, yeah. as, as we know. No, it's not. Because <laughs> well, there's um, nothing Hispanic. That's an actual negative term towards South Americans. See? There you go. Learning shit all the time. Um, my last name is it's Portuguese, and I have absolutely zero Portuguese or Spanish in my blood as my both my DNA tests came back. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have that 2%... Nigerian, two <laughs> percent Nigerian. Huh. That's from, how you got her. That's two percent. That's two yeah. percent. <laughs> from from my dad's side at that, so you know where that is. Uh, um, but yeah, that's uh, I, I went to Indiana and people would ask me for my green card and shit like that, and it was like, well, what are you talking about? Well, you're 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 a, you're a, a Mexican, so you you know from California, you need, you need a green card to come to school here. And that was my first taste of just blatant bullshit racism. And that was that was from other white kids towards another white kid. Like I just because of my last name. Um that's Kent, that's where you and I kind of met up. It was about that time, eighth grade, ninth grade. But you grew yeah, up in yeah. a totally different area. You you didn't grow up in trailer parks and uh half abandoned apartment complexes and shit. Yeah, I I grew up a block away from those things. <laughs> Uh, no, like the the little town in Indiana, rural Indiana that we're from, is just it's it's all white and it's a tiny tiny little town. Um, I saw a token black kid once <laughs> when I was a kid. Like we did not have uh, 
any diversity whatsoever. There, there, um, there were four mixed uh, kids that moved in right as we were graduating. Right, but I right. did not grow up with with no. um, any kind of diversity. No, um, none. Yeah, so my family and friends would have sworn on stacks of Bibles that they were not racist. There was not a racist bone in their body, um, and they believed it, and I believed it. And I would have said the exact same thing about myself. It wasn't until until getting older, and like I'm still learning now. Like I'm not close to being done learning. Uh, but a lot of behaviors from when I was growing up, uh, language and behaviors that were just commonplace, I would consider vilely racist today. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was yeah. just accepted, and it was... I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly where I was going with that thought. <laughs> Um, you lost me and Royce too. We're still wondering yeah. what the hell happened, but yeah, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. I, I, I think I was just trying. I think I was just trying to lay the groundwork of, of like my upbringing. Like I, I did not. I wasn't exposed to other cultures, other races, um, anything. So like my uh, my education about racism has all like all been. Well, let me say it like this: my valuable education about racism has all been. Uh, like post going to the military. It's all been yeah. in my adult life. Which wasn't always the yeah. best education either. Um, Royce, how, how, did, how did you grow up, Royce? Well, um, I grew up in South Central, quote unquote, Los Angeles. Uh, lived there, was born there all my life until I got older and moved away. Uh, so when we had the LA riots years ago, 2012, um, I lived about five miles from that, where Reginald Denny was beaten up, uh, obviously a little further down from uh, Rodney King, but uh, that's where I live. That's where you know I'm from, uh, 50th and Normandy's, where uh, the house I grew up in, um, which is not too far from anywhere downtown uh, or uh, by the Coliseum or USC. So uh, that's where I, I grew up. Uh, my dad, my family really never lived together, uh, but my dad lived in Carson, which was more upper middle class. Uh, he worked for Northrop Grumman uh, back in that time, so he was an aeronautical engineer, but we didn't get the, me and my sister and my mom, we didn't get that part of, of his life. So, um, But we didn't know anything different. Uh, we had family all, all around, uh, thankfully. We had a big family, and um, you know, California was not as bad for me until I grew up, until I got to be an adult. I didn't know racism uh, personally until um, I started driving, until I had to get a job, and I had a supervisor try to prevent me from drinking water. So uh, those are the things that uh, you know you end up getting when you get older and you don't know why that is. That's crazy. Um, but I also have a very, very white Jewish last name, and my mom taught us to use that name. Uh, and I've gone into several job interviews uh, and them thinking that I was going to be something else. Uh, so, you know, you go in knowing that when you see somebody's facial features and, you know, they're looking at you like, are you Royce Kaufman? I am. And I have an identification to prove it, as well as my birth certificates, where's my uh, high school diploma, whatever you need that says who I am. It's, that's who I am. And so uh, those things happened more and more as I grew up. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that comes to, brings to mind something that you were saying, Rick, yeah. the other day about naming the kids. Yes. So I grew up with uh, parents that are from Philly. So my parents are from Germantown. My mom's from Germantown, Philly, like bad Philly, the part where the cops just don't go anymore. And my dad grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, and he moved down to Philly to go to college. And that's where she met my father in Philly. And my mother grew up with the very last slave name. Um, she didn't like it. She absolutely hated it. Um, Watson. You don't, you, don't very, you don't see that name very often anymore. And when she met my father, she was like, yes. Yes, I'm going to be a Purdue. Let's take this. 
And that was the naming convention convention that my mother came up with when she named all her kids. My 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 first name is Sarethia. I mean, no one no one knows that name. My sister's name is Maisie, and my baby sister's name is Palanaka Lohalani. It's a Hawaiian name. So just like you, Royce, she, a, Palanaka shows up to a, a job and they're thinking she's some Polynesian local girl, and they some skinny black girl shows up and they're like, "What the? Are you Palanaka?" They can't even say it. They can't even say it. So, and of course, there's tons of Maisies out there. Um, it was for my mom. I think it was more of, I'm going to raise my kids differently. I knew what it felt like to grow up in Philly. I know what it feels like to be, um, racially profiled and I don't want that for my kids. So she, I mean, as batshit crazy as my mom is and I love her to death, she, she, she came up with the great naming convention and I, and I actually, honestly, I did it with all my kids when I had kids. Um, me and Anthony talked about it. Like, you can't, like, we talk about little Autumn Love all the time. Her name is Autumn Love. Like, <laughs> I mean, she's going to show up for an interview and they're going to be like, Autumn? So it's just one of those things. I think as, as black people growing up, we've learned to protect ourselves against racial profiling. I... I see some names out there. I'm like, ooh, you should have named your kid Brittany. I I, mm. I work with the girl. She's gorgeous, gorgeous model skin, um, black girl, absolutely gr- gorgeous. When I saw her name on paperwork when she was coming to me to work for me, her first name was Brittany, I, and then she showed up this tall, gorgeous looking model looking black girl. And I was like, your mama named you Brittany, Brittany Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> her mama knew. It's. It's something that black people over time have learned or some of us have started doing to help protect our children from racial profiling. Yeah. And that's so I'd like to seg into into privilege and what privilege is, because a lot of people get a lot of white people get really pissed off when (laughs) they're told that they have privilege, white privilege, um, because they they're like. I've had struggles. I my life's not easy. I don't have privilege, and I I want to I want to I want to explain what privilege is, uh, so that so that we can just kind of establish the vocabulary for for moving forward. But the the fact that as black people you have to even think about racial implications of the names that you would give to your children, the, the fact that white people d- that doesn't even enter into the calculus when you're naming a baby that's textbook white privilege right there um but anyway so so to back up a little bit so what is so privilege is anything that gives you an advantage against others that you did not have control over something you were born with so race is one of those things but it can also be your your citizenship so the fact that we're the four of us are u.s citizens gives us privilege over people that are not U.S. citizens. Um, Men have a level of privilege over women. Um, Straight people have more privilege than, uh, you know, bisexuals or gay or lesbian or, uh, you know, and let's not even get started with transgender and everything else. Like, there are so many things, wealth, um, education, uh, the family that you were born into, the neighborhood you grew up in, all of these sorts of things give you privilege. And there's things called, or it's called intersectionality because privilege is not a yes or no. It's not a zero sum game. Everybody has some level of privilege and it's basically just where you are on the scale. Um, so like Royce, for example, uh, you know, you're a male, so you get male privilege, but your, your skin isn't white, so you don't get the white privilege. Right. So um, a white woman uh, would have the white privilege, but not the the gender, you know, whatever there's that's called intersectionality, where there's like crossover depending on the situation. Um, And of course, you know, white skin is a privilege, but not in every circumstance. Right. The fact like Amos said, uh, when he grew up in a neighborhood in Southern California, being the the only white kid didn't feel like a privilege to him at the time. Um, so it's not a yes or no. So 
I, I really wish there was a way to get like all Americans to understand what people mean when they say white privilege. And it's, it's those, th it's not a, you, your life is easy. Um, yeah. Kind of yeah. Thing. It has nothing it, to do with, with how easy your life was. It's about the things <clears throat> that because of the society that you live in, the aspects of your life that are not within your control have yep. an effect on how you're going to live and the opportunities you're given and that will be available to you. Um, so, so look at it this way. I got, I got another way to put it. If, if you didn't have, then you would have an additional challenge, right? So like if it was, if it was really hard to get, um, you know, a particular job, right? You're, you would have had an even harder time if you had less privilege, like, black skin or you were female or you were gay or you were, uh, you know, didn't have any money, you were poor, you know, whatever. Those are additional challenges. And if you don't have those additional challenges, it's a privilege. Right. So. Yeah. And that's. Uh... But so here's the deal, though. Everybody, because we're Americans in the United States, we actually like like you said, we are privileged. Like the United mm -hmm. States is is we can make things happen if we want. Be despite Anthony grew up in Southern California getting beat up trying to go home at, you know, as a kid. That I mean, it's a matter of perspective. Are you going to sit there in the corner and cry about getting beat up or are you going to fight your way through it? I I could have easily sat down and said I'm black and I'm female. You know what? All the odds are against me. But I didn't. But the one thing that kept me going through a lot of things is because my parents didn't my parents raised me a certain way and they specifically left out racism when they were talking about things. They said, Rick, you're going to have to work harder than everybody else. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to be smarter than everybody else. And you're going to have to prove yourself every day of your life. Nowhere in there that they ever say it's because of the color of my skin. So that's what I did. I got out and I just started fighting and doing what I needed to do to get by to be the person that I am today. And I will tell you, all the colors of the rainbow that I have come across, nowhere did I ever look at anybody and say, it's because of the color of your skin. It was always, are they nice? What's that old saying? Treat people the way you want to be treated. And that's mm. how I always went into everything. And me and Anthony argue about it, because when I meet somebody, you get an A+. Plus. You get an A+, plus. I love you, you're my best <laughs> friend, let's go out and drink together, let's nope. hang out. Nope. Like, Hey, who are you? And uh, maybe Royce, that's what you're talking about. I gave you that look because I, you got an A plus. I loved you from the day I met you. That's that might have been. That, nope. <laughs> that that might have been. It wasn't. It wasn't a color thing. It was just a person. It was a human thing. And uh, I get it from both sides. And people will say she doesn't understand. I I grew up and I remember. I remember the first time I felt it. I was five. And I was at the playground, and some little boy called me the big N-word. I had no idea what it meant. I had no mm -hmm. clue. So I went home, grabbed a stick. My dad was cutting stuff in the yard. Went home, and I grabbed a stick. And he said, where are you going with that, girl? I said, I'm going to the, I'm going to the park to beat up a boy. Okay. So I went back to the park, and I beat that little boy with the stick. <laughs> I went home, threw the stick in the rubbish, and I went and watched cartoons. And then what, what happened next? Doom, doom, doom. Knock on my mom's door. The little boy beat up with his mama. She tried to yell at my mama. And Royce, you know our mamas are crazy. Our mamas are crazy. So the, <laughs> the first thing my mom said was, where the hell did he learn that word from? From you, you stupid bitch. Get away from my door. That's where he learned it. He learned it at home. It starts at home. That's how he learned the word. Five years old, played on the playground. He doesn't know anything. And then he comes out with that word. I didn't know what it meant either. I just knew the way he said it hurt my feelings. I had no yep. clue what it meant. So I had to, my mom had to sit down and explain to me what it was. I had no idea. And I, and the, and the whole, my whole story is I just never, I, I tried, I tried. And that's the way I raised our kids. Yeah. Look at people for who they are. Are they mean? Or are they nice? That's the two categories. Are they nice to you or are they going to be mean to you? Right? Mm -hmm. If you're mean to me, that's it. I mentally unfriended you. I'm done. I'm going to move on. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm quick. I'm <laughs> so, so now we have the, the breakdown of our oldest four kids. Okay. We have a boy, a, 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 a brown boy that likes white girls. We have a 
brown girl that likes white boys. We have a white girl that likes brown girls. (laughs) And we have a brown girl that likes Hispanic or, or Latin girls. Like... There's, there's no, there's, it's whatever around here. <laughs> That's confusing. It's, it is confusing. You think you're, it's I'm like... confused. Like I, I just need them to find somebody that I love them. Like just, <laughs> I don't care what they look like. You guys sound like the Will Smith household, man. That's some weird stuff you guys got going it's, on over there. It's, it's a comedy some show. Freedoms. Here. Too much freedoms going on in there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so, and Royce, that's the one thing I told my kids we don't talk about color. And when they told me about, you know, the gay and lesbian community, community I told my girls, I said, you know what? If you like both sides, you're just being greedy because now you're getting the best of both worlds. You're just greedy. <laughs> you want both? Greedy yeah. asses. Let's just, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So, I figured I would uh, I, I'd, I'd open it up a little bit and share a moment that uh, changed the the a moment in which I knew that I had grown a little bit as far as learning to understand the racial divide and the the way that the system is and how our lives affect or affected by where we grew up and things like that. Back at Shaw, I was at Shaw, South Carolina for four years. Um, I had been there. I don't know when, what year it was. I'd been there long enough to, I think I might have been married to Lisa. Probably. So 97, 98. We left in 2000. So um, it'd been a while and I'd been spending quite a bit of time with uh, her family and things like that. And uh, um, not that that's a reason for it, but I had a good friend at work, uh, and and Ken, I know you told me not to call out certain names, but I'm going to call this one out. His name is Colby Sidnor. Colby Sidnor. <laughs> he was a senior man when I got to when I got to Shaw, and he he and I hit it off great. We both like video games. We both like uh, lots of different music, um, and I don't know what gave me the sense that I could say it, but we were at a party one night. And an issue came up, and I don't remember how it led to it. I just remember what I said. And the words that I said were, uh, Sid, you are the whitest N-word I've ever met in my life. Oh. And I didn't just, of course, I was drunk. I didn't say it just once. I said it like three times. Oh, probably at least. But yeah. from my per, my <laughs> point of view at that time, that was okay. Like, that that was language that people everyone around me were was using and it was like this first time i'd av- actually used that word in a non converse like were non, you the not only this white person convers- around no huh. but he was the only black person huh. mm. and i remember the next day no one ever mentioned to me not a single soul mentioned it to me ever oh so you said it to a black guy yeah but I mean, we had, we had we had nine white people there, but he was the only black guy there, and no one had ever me- no one ever mentioned it to me at all ever. But it, it sat with me like it stuck in my head at the time, and going further into the future, like how did I feel that that was okay in any way, shape, or form? How did he feel? Mm-hmm. Did he say anything? He never said anything, and our relationship just continued as normal. Like we just had it, nothing changed from my perspective in our relationship. We still drank together. We still played games. We still hung out at work and out of work and everything else. Mm -hmm. But that memory never left me. And that con that conversation in my head of why, how would that be okay? It wasn't in what way could, but how did I even consider that to be okay? Right. It's not, it's not that it's a word I'd ever used in conversation before. But for the, whatever reason, at that time, in like the late 90s, my brain said, hey, this is okay. And not only is it okay, yeah. but let's use it in a way that demeans it even more and demeans him even more than, than you know, it, it just is, yeah. it's probably, and, and again, I went through a nasty divorce. It's probably the most despicable thing I've ever said in my entire life to someone that I cared about. Yeah. I've said some nasty shit to some people I don't like. 
you, you say nasty stuff to people you do like. Right. But, so, but this is like the worst. <laughs> what you think, Royce? Yeah. <laughs> Should we beat him up now or later? All the time. No, I got, I got him. J- just, just a constant beating. That's what I deserve. Um, well, and that's interesting to me, Amos, because like, so like in high school, even like we we didn't talk like that. Like right. we didn't we didn't say that. Uh, now, well, at least not in that context. Like I, I couldn't imagine. Uh, like the mid or late nineties, I can't imagine either one of us calling someone that. Right. Uh, but that word was in our vocabulary though. Right. Because we both listened to was... NWA a lot. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I, mean, but I, mean, Royce, I mean, like in, can you stop spoken, this please? I, I mean, in conversational, <laughs> no, no, no. But I mean, in conversational language, but, but no. not in that context. Like for example, uh, have you, have you guys ever heard a problematic word for Brazil nuts? Nuts. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's a there's a really terrible, terrible alternative word for Brazil nuts that I grew up saying that my family used that as that is that is what this food item is called. This is just the nomenclature. I knew no better until I was probably Oh my God, I was probably like in sixth grade or something like that before I even understood that this word means a different thing and it's really, really bad and you should not ever, ever use it. Uh, yeah. So a bad weave in the chat is like, I have. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Well, you know, ignorance, ignorance isn't, uh, it's, it's a worldwide situation. Mm-hmm. Most people don't know a lot of things or know that it's bad because no one tells them that it's bad. Um, I learned about a, a uh, I don't know if you guys know about who Black Pete or Black Peter is, and I say it in the accent, uh, but in Europe, Black Peter or Black Peter uh, was part of the Santa Claus folklore, uh, oh. and in, he was the one who gave coal to children. Mm. And of course, it was categorized and pictured as, you know, this bumbling black face, black body, no shirt, uh, kind of individual. And it is celebrated in the Netherlands. It's a actual part of the holiday. And it was decided, I think it was maybe 2012 or so that they were going to change it. And there was a fight. And my ex-wife at the time is German. And I talked to her about, she's like, Oh yeah, black Peter. (laughs) What? Mm -hmm. (laughs) But why would she have an issue with it? Because she doesn't know anything. She's not that person. She's not this entity that you're picturing. Uh, they, they don't even have a problem with Krampus. So why would they have a problem with, uh, with Black Peter? So, you know, ignorance and these bad things or, or bad ways of going didn't start out here. But they, are, they grew here uh, substantially. Um, the more you read, the more you ask, the more you talk about, the more you do research you learn that um, our society is built on it and continues to try to stand on it. Uh, that's what this fight is, is that the Americans want to stand on hate. They want to stand on the laws that built this country, uh, the people that built it, not just the, the black people, but the uh, Asian Americans that were brought here, uh, the Latinos that were brought here uh, to build this nation. Uh, my girlfriend, who is white, is reading a book called White Rage by Carol Anderson, and it talks about uh, our presidents, uh, Lincoln, for one, who is supposed to be our, our, our person who freed us, gave us a mass place for proclamation. He didn't want to do it. One thing he didn't want to do, it. he blamed white, uh, black people about why they didn't leave. They, he put in a plan of an exodus to move uh, slaves and black people uh, to South America. But nobody talks about that because, as my girlfriend is realizing, what part of history are we not getting the full story about? Um, you know, even the, the next presidents after that couldn't do, they're blaming the slaves, the black people who were being oppressed and can't do this and can't do that for the destruction of America before it was even put together 100%. Um, Ignorance goes both ways. Black people have plenty of ignorance. 
Uh, I am not a person to say that we don't have our own stupidity or ignorance towards whoever. Uh, but in this kind of situations that are going on, your your beliefs or your freedom from what you had, Anthony, of calling a, another person uh, the whitest in, whether you said the ER version or the A version, is that comfortability. Not just because of the music you were listening to, but because you were comfortable in who you were with to agree to be able to say something and then later say, why am I feeling this comfortable when he hasn't called me out of my name? He hasn't called me these names, but I'm calling this person name. I'm calling these Brazilian nuts these things, but I know that's probably derogatory because that's not what you call them. Um, why do we give these nicknames? But only Americans do that. Americans do that. Europeans don't do that. Africans don't do that. South Americans don't do that. Um, Asians don't do that. They don't give nicknames to products and name us as Americans. Mm. We do that to ourselves as American citizens. Uh, we do that to ourselves because we don't know any better. If we do, we don't care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the part now I think most people are in this generation is starting to get to the point where they're starting to care about everybody else. You know, we want the freedoms to uh, procreate with whoever we want to procreate with. We want to be able to love. We want to be able to hate. We want to be able to do all these things. We want to have the freedom that this country says we're supposed to have, but never gave to anybody other than a black male. I'm sorry, a white male. That's what this country was built on was the freedoms of white males, not white females, white males. And then when those things started to loosen up and they started to go away, uh, white males fought back and they're this still is all back. this is. They're still fighting back. And, yep. you know, whether it's an all lives matter or blue lives matter and all that mumbo jumbo, the only <clears throat> difference is, is that the people that have a problem with it is that black is in, in that title. That's the only thing that ever changes because mm -hmm. we don't want that part to change. And if it does, why don't you do it somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And if it does, which I don't have a problem yeah. with, I, to me, I believe in an exodus, um, mm. a voluntary exodus. I've thought about it. I've talked to, I've planned it out. I put it on paper. Uh, and I know that the U S government would back it. The problem is that let's say five years afterward, America would be destroyed because white males now don't have anybody to fight but themselves. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the destruction of society, it all it goes from white males. So if I don't have anybody to fight, then I have to fight my own people. And so all the science and all the this and construction, all these things that this country was built on would be gone. There would be no more advancement. And then you look at other kind of wars and situations. America would be the... I call it the, the last Babylon, would be totally destroyed. And uh, that's the, the next part that's coming. And Exodus would be amazing. People have called for it for a long time. African countries have welcomed um, Americans, black Americans to come. Uh, there's even some European and Asian countries that have asked for it. Um, not just because of the money, because they know the power of money and the black community has enough to spend, even though we're broke. We spend money uh, that, that we don't have. So we talk about reparations. We ain't getting no reparations. We're spending that. Um, but people are asking for it because this country was never founded for the freedoms of anybody other than white males. And wealthy white males at that. Yes. And you can talk about all oh, freedom of religion, freedom of this. If you weren't wealthy, white male, where did you go? You went to Australia because you were the criminal element of that movement that couldn't come to America. So now you go to another one and now kill the, the indigenous people that are there, as the wealthy did here. Yep. <sighs> it, it, Love it, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was, there was some interesting perspective there that I have not heard. That's, that's great. Um, yeah, what, what, I, what we know is that we don't know. And then, and there's yeah. 
so much. There, there's, there's, there's just so much. And even... the reason I was hesitant to do this episode is because I feel like my role right now is just to shut the hell up and listen. Right. And as a podcaster, like you can't just like turn on the mic and just sit there and listen. So I was, yeah, I was super nervous. So I'm glad that you guys are bringing perspective um, to, to these subjects. This is fantastic. Yeah, and and my thing is, uh, if if anything, most of our audience, we can't. I have talked about this. Most of our audience is Diamond Club. Not all of them, but most of them. Most of our audience is white. Most of our audience is male. So, if we can say anything to that small audience, we have is just to listen, be willing to talk about it. Mostly amongst yourselves, because as I understand, most black folk are getting tired of being called and saying, hey, come talk to me about this and share with this because it's just the, the fad of the moment right now. Actually read, listen, and learn That's and, it. and yep. take it in and actually give a shit and not make it something that you're just, just want to do for right now. Make it a, a lifelong uh, a journey to understand as much as you can about the people that don't have the privilege that you have about where your privilege comes from and understand that everyone has a little bit of privilege in some way. And you need to understand that so that you know how not to let that privilege affect your dealings with other people. And if, if anything else, like just keep learning. There's so much out there. (laughs) <laughs> non-mainstream education about what's going on right now, what's been going on for the last 400, 600 years, and where where we are versus where we should be. And you're not going to get it from school. You're not going to get it from big-ass textbooks. And you don't necessarily have to get it from every person around you. There's plenty out there to to learn and, and, and read and gather before you can even have an educated conversation and know half of what you're talking about. Like Kent said earlier, you know, if you don't, if you don't define things, if you're not on a common def- definition of what, of what the terms even mean, how can you have a conversation mm-hmm. about any of it? Cause you're talking about two different things. So yeah, I think the most helpful thing is, is to, uh, d- diversify your sources. So, I guess that's a little bit of a pun because um, obviously I'm talking about diversity, like, you know, white, black, uh, Asian, Latino, et cetera. Um, But also, I mean, diversify your sources. So even if you found a black voice that you really like, don't let that be the only black voice you listen to. Find many, find many different perspectives um, on on all subjects. And and the only thing that you can do is learn at that point. Um, Yeah, and that's, I've been doing a lot (laughs) A lot of that lately and a, a lot of listening there's a lot to listen for i mean even for me i love to research i love to listen for everything uh i i pride myself in learning different cultures uh because it's you can't go into somebody else's house and think you as an american especially that you are somebody <laughs> you have to go in there knowing that you are not so when I go to Germany, I have to learn some kind of German. So I go to the restroom. If I go to Japan, I have to learn know some kind of Japanese so I can be uh, presentable. So I can let you know that I am not an, in- an ignorant American, which mm-hmm. the world sees us as. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need to see. You, I need you to see me not just as an ignorant American and then an ignorant black person, but I need you to see me as who I am. Um, even the words, you know, I, so the research you have to do, and for me now recently, I'm learning more of what it means as white and black. Because in America, that is the only definition of who we are. If you go mm-hmm. to Asia, they don't look at each other as yellow. As native or indigenous, they don't look at themselves as red. Mm-hmm. When you go to South America, they're not looking at themselves as brown they're looking at themselves as whatever tribe they're from or whatever country they're from. Uh, But we have the own distinction, which came from Europe. But it's interesting to understand that uh, 
even Europeans didn't call themselves whites until they brought slavery to America and they moved to America. They chose to put themselves as a distinctive color that has a definition opposite of the Negro, Negro, um, which is what the Spanish called us. Mm -hmm. So you have to give yourself, if the Negro was dark and uh, ins anything that is insidious, that's hateful in the world is called black mm -hmm. in every way. It's the absence of light. It is, but light is pure is this and that. So now you have defined yourself as white America, as this purity, as this blessing, as this love of everything. And now you bring in this black slave that is uh, a, a savage, that is this and that. Um, so now we have defined our country as white and black, good and evil. Um, and in that, you lose who you are. Obviously, the slaves that came here and the children that they had don't know who they are. We don't know who we are until we get a DNA test. And even then, you still don't know who you are. Um, but whites can always say, oh, yeah, I got Irish. I have this. I have that. But black people will say, well, I have Irish, too. I have this. I, I did my DNA test, and I, I'm learning every day that my people not just came from Nigeria, but came from Sierra Leone, which was the first, very, very first African American um, place that was created from the Africans that were freed from here, from America, that the British freed, uh, that fought in the war with, between America. There were 500 slaves that were freed from the British and took and settled in Sierra Leone and were the first people considered African Americans. First ever. Hmm. Hmm. And this was in the 1800s. We didn't dig that deep. No. But we yeah. didn't hear about African Americans <laughs> until, what, 1995, 93, somewhere around there? Something, 89? yeah. Something uh, like that, yeah. And even that point, as Americans, that's not true. We're not African Americans. We are, most people here are just really just American. And that's the part I think that we lose, that separate part is we're Americans. And we... Um, are entitled to the same laws that white America has. Um, it's just the point that we're not in a position to enforce the laws because we are ignorant, which means you just don't have the knowledge uh, that most white people have to enforce those rules and those laws. And if we do get educated on that, uh, then, you know, something else tragic may happen to those people. But... Um, <laughs> This is a simple fact that there's so much information out there that social media allows you to have and uh, books that people uh, publish and do research on that allows everyone to educate themselves and to understand that you were living an ignorant lie uh, because you just weren't given the information. And eventually, white America will be so upset that they were not given the truth. And black America will be upset that uh, we weren't given the truth either. Latino community will be upset. Most people don't know who Leo Cesar Chavez is that fought for equality here in Southern California. Um, but we do. People that live in California know who that is. And, um, you know, you have, to, you have to have someone bring that out and have everyone open up to it and listen and say, you know what, that's just, that isn't right. That's not fair. Uh, if we're going to be fair, let's just be fair then. If it's wrong, it's wrong. That's it. No matter what color it is, what male or female, when wrong is wrong, that's what it is. The laws are, these new laws were put out, for, it's supposed to be for everyone. So why don't we just make sure that it, we use it for everyone? But you got to educate yourself. You got to. You have to. You, you have to do it yourself. And don't be afraid to ask that one black guy or one black person that you know, ask them the questions. Find out if they know anything about it. Because you may be educating them. And there's nothing wrong with changing your ignorance to intelligence. Stupidity is what the problem you'll have. That's when you have that knowledge and you fail to use it. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
Anything to add to, add to that, Rick? I was just feeling myself. Royce killed it. I was just sitting here staring at him going, mm-hmm, that's my man, that's my man. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to no. get to that soon. We're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's right. He's right. People put, put names on it, but I didn't raise my kids with colors either. The kids grew up knowing peach and brown. Right. Mommy, you're the brown crown, and Daddy's the peach crown. Yep. Got it. And, and my boys didn't either. I asked them when they were old enough to know the difference between me and their mom, and it was like, Dad has a big nose. Mom has long hair. Right. They didn't. They didn't see that because we didn't teach them. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. And as long as you don't teach the hate, uh, they're not going to learn the hate. Now, unfortunately, they know it now. <laughs> the only other bad thing is they learn it from their mom. But that's another episode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, children are going to have questions, and we should be able to be prepared to answer them. And. Um, we're either teaching them right or you're teaching them wrong because love doesn't have a care in the world about what color you are, how tall you are, how heavy you are, how many limbs you got. No, it doesn't care. It just really doesn't care. Yeah. But the key, though, is people have to be open to want to learn it. You got some people that just they're stuck in their ways I, and they I don't. Got, I got solutions for them, too. I know you do. You got solutions for all kinds of things. Right? I've, been, I've been telling Kent about my like solutions every other for those man. people for a long time. He's got like solution. every other white man, you got all the answers. Oh, oh no, 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 no. I, I have a solution for, for very specific problems, not all the answers. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Okay. Oh. Okay. I'll be here to listen to those two. <laughs> Maybe in the post show. Okay. Um, uh, Rick, you can be found on Twitter at Sarithia, S A R I E T H I A. Yes. Um, so if you want to follow my wife and discuss all of my failings with her, she'd be happy to <laughs> happy to share She'll her stories. Stop it! He's She'll selling himself. He's selling himself short. He's a good man. That's that's what we do on this show. <laughs> uh, Royce, where can people find you to learn more about uh, more about you? At the house. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Southern California. Just look for Royce Southern and uh, just look for the house and uh, <laughs> stop on by. He'd be chilling the in the pool. And I got rum here. I got beer. I got vodka. I got all kinds of stuff. We'll sit and have a conversation. There you go. Uh, Kent, how about you, man? Yeah, that, that sounds bad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up Royce. I'm going, <laughs> going to his house. <laughs> uh, look for it. Look for it. <laughs> I'm over on Twitter at RM underscore Del Noche. I haven't been posting much there lately. I've just been doing a lot of reading. Uh, what about you, Amos? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ethan Kane, E-T-H-A-N-C-A-I-N-E. And I've been... Doing a lot of reading and a lot of reposting, some funny stuff, other things that just made me fucking angry, and I wanted to share because I think everybody should be fucking angry right now. And you can if follow Amos this- is angry, everyone. Angry. <laughs> See why you got to be angry? The white man's always angry. It's right, something. like it's just they're... always angry, just carrying anger on their shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason. He's he's not. He's just very vocal now, and I think he's he's voicing his anger now that he can but he's not always <laughs> angry he's a big old teddy bear he's not yeah. always angry call me fat well. i was gonna say emphasis on big old <laughs> big and old got it okay thanks babe. <laughs> appreciate that you can find the show on twitter at ritual misery r-i-t-u-a-l-m-i-s-e-r-y and uh yeah and come join our discord yeah bit.ly slash rmp discord Hey, uh, I want to give a special thank you to Royce for coming on the show on kind of a late notice um, and, and allowing us to have an open and honest discussion with you. And uh, Rick, same with you. Thanks for popping in, for yeah. volunteering. I didn't even have to drag her. I, she, she volunteered. <laughs> well, she heard I was coming on. So you know, you know he, uh, said, he said Royce, and I was like, so you, you want were me all there? in. You want me all there? In. All in. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, I feel so... <laughs> So Adequate. less, know, so less threatened than I should. Because <laughs> I'm too far away. <laughs> don't don't give me an arm's reach. Give me an arm's reach. I'm gonna I'm touch it. <laughs> well, you're stuck touching yourself for now. Uh, you can find all the links on the show and everything that we reference uh, on ritualmisery.com. That's our website. Go there. It's broken right now. I'm trying to fix it. Give me a break. And uh, ritualmisery.com. Cruise on by there. 
Kent, yeah, this will be the part live. where you start saying some of it. Yeah, we're we're <laughs> live um, in our in our normal form about once a month. But Ritual Misery does stream every week, 7 p.m. Pacific, uh, twitch.tv slash Ritual Misery. Sometimes we're on diamondclub.tv. That's not as consistent these days as it used to be. Twitch.tv slash Ritual Misery. Amos, whose who's music are we listening to? <laughs> you suck so bad. So bad, Ken. I didn't even hear it coming in until I stopped talking. I'm just going to wait for it to start <laughs> fade. And now that it's fading, Kevin I'll McLeod. tell you that all the music on the show Thank was brought McLeod. to you by Kevin McLeod. He's amazing. Cruise on by Incompetech.com and get your own music. And uh, thanks for listening for, Kent, for, for Kent's stupid, lame, no-timing, having ass. For Royce, for Rick, and for me, this has been your... Very educational and hopefully inspiring Ritual Misery podcast. And now I'm not going to play the music. I'm going to hit the... Where's the thing? Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) R-I-T-U-A-L-M-I-S-E-L-Y That's a show. In case you didn't hear Amos uh, say how to spell the the (laughs) website. Uh, Uh... you guys kept saying misery, you know. I mean, uh, Missouri, and I'm like, I know it's the same thing, but <laughs> I think it should be misery. <laughs> <laughs>